morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for being patient. Ian, over to you for the main part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, everyone, for holding on. A thousand apologies. Just a, a nightmare this morning with regard to IT. Everything was going swimmingly, and then everything went dreadfully wrong. So I'm on the reserve computer now, and uh, we're going to talk about some land registration issues, uh, some tips and traps with regard to land registration. So hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, hopefully you can see the slides. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about today is some important issues, I think, with regard to the migration of local land charges via the land registry. And to give you an update as to what's happening with regard to that migration exercise. The first thing to say with regard to the migration exercise is that the Infrastructure Act 2015 was designed to ensure that the responsibility for 336 land charges register, registers was transmitted to the land registry as efficiently as possible. And the first transfer took place in September of uh, 2018. And so far, there's been um, a moderate success of about 30 local land charges migrating to the land registry. The intention is over the next few years that this will be ramped up. And two things really to start with. First of all, this isn't land registry taking over um, the issue of searches generally with regard to the conveyancing process. It's not the land registry becoming a central hub as it were for searches. Um, it is simply a migration of local land charges, not additional inquiries. It is also a standardization process, a facility that should allow online access instead of sort of microfiche or manual systems that some local authorities have. And it should facilitate an instant online access, currently a set fee of £15 per um, search. The important thing to understand and appreciate is that as far as the process from a conveyancer's perspective is concerned, you're simply now doing a search of the local land charges register retained by the land registry. You can go on the land registry website, it will reveal which local land charges departments have migrated and therefore which searches should be undertaken of the land registry rather than the local authority. All the search providers that you utilize are geared up to this migration, this system and this process. So there shouldn't really be any sort of a complication from your perspective. There is in essence a raft of good news. The good news should be that there should be an instantaneous response with regard to a local land charge uh, that's undertaken online. For an official search, you should be receiving the search result within 24 hours, and that search should be accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As I've mentioned, there is now a flat fee of £15. There shouldn't be any form of delay with regard to the production of the search, and significantly and importantly for conveyances, where the search is undertaken of the local land charges register held by the land registry, you can update the search, do a new one for the next six months free of charge. So all of these things are potentially very good news. And they're the sort of direct benefits. The indirect benefits are that the land registry is in essence filtering through during the migration process errors and problems with regard to local land charges and working with local land charges departments to try and ensure that duplications or omissions or problems are dealt with. So again we've got this sort of check and balance being performed by the land registry as the migration takes place. You need to be aware of a number of things relating to the migration process. Firstly, the land registry has set up various systems and processes to assist local land charges departments to make sure the migration is relatively simple and straightforward. The second thing to understand and appreciate is that when a search is undertaken of the land registry, the land registry will provide authority file references because it will be necessary for you to make further inquiry of local authorities where local land charges are revealed. So the land registry maintain the register, the actual local land charges themselves are retained by local authorities. And therefore, if there is an issue, it would be necessary for you to make inquiry 
of the local authority and the authority file reference should assist you in that regard. The search is provided by the land registry, but local land charges are still registered by the local authority and local land charges are varied and cancelled during that process. So again, important to understand and appreciate that the land registry is preserving, maintaining and updating the register, but additional inquiries relating to local land charges need you to contact the relevant local land charges department. That shouldn't be quite as cumbersome a process as you would first envisage. The reason for that is that the land registry give you this reference number and local land charges departments and their officers instead of dealing with inquiries relating to searches should be able to provide a better service in connection with information relating to local land charges as hopefully their time should be freed up as a consequence of the migration process the Local land charges register search uh, is simply a search of the land registry. There is an official search with the production of a search certificate. There is an availability of a repeat of the search for a six month period at no charge. And there are electronic links to relevant documents which should make life significantly easier for all concerned. And so I think there's a great deal of good news with regard to this process. So, what about personal searches? Well, personal searches are replaced, in essence, by an online, unofficial search that can be undertaken by the client, by you, by a search provider at any time. As far as additional information is concerned with regard to local land charges, then the government website, Local Land Charges Service, is the place to go to for details. The only downside that I've seen with the regard to the entire process is where you want to do a local land charges search of large areas. The system doesn't seem to be able to cope with that, but the system of polygon searches, the availability of uh, changing the polygon, polygon or the search area, your search provider should be able to do that, which should mean that you can search target property search additional properties within the vicinity of target property, and it should be far easier a process than ever it was when dealing with local authorities. So the first tip that I want to mention is just to be aware of this migration process. I'm told that 2022, we're gonna see a ramping up of the system. What the land registry is doing is getting clusters of local authorities together to try and speed up the process. So South Wales is uh, a cluster that's going to be going live with the uh, land registry soon uh, so is i think the yorkshire north yorkshire area so just keep aware of it just be aware of it just ensure that you are familiar with what your search provider is doing with regard to this new process it's very interesting it's very exciting and it should make life a lot easier the idea of having to wait 12 weeks for a local land charges search should disappear he said optimistically the next thing that I want to mention with regard to the new system is, as I've said already, requesting information is made of the local land charges department of the relevant local authority, but the land registry acts as a conduit in that regard. If there are errors with regard to local land charges after migration, then the land registry will compensate. There is a system for um, claiming um, or clawing back compensation if the error is a local land charges department error rather than a land registry error but that's of no concern to you or your search provider as the compensation is met by the land registry at first instance there will be errors there will be problems uh, it's just the amount of data that the land registry is receiving but you're still supported by the compensation scheme in fact potentially a better compensation scheme created by the land registry than provided by local authorities so tips and traps first thing be aware of that secondly be aware of the advantages of it your search providers will tell you about the advantages where the land registry is dealing with local land charges i just want you to know that you can in essence do a new search within six months of the official search at no cost to your client the next thing that i want to talk about are restrictions and notices and i talk about restrictions and notices a lot a lot when i mention land registration 
the idea of protecting interest in land using notices and restrictions. But of course, the next point that I want to emphasize is the fact that overriding interests are binding on a buyer for value in any event. And therefore, as well as considering and taking care when inspecting the registers, it is important that our client, our surveyor or valuer, if instructed, and we as conveyancers check the information produced by the seller with regard to the existence of overriding interests. So I think that we come at overriding interests from a triangular approach. We need to see what the seller is disclosing to us in the contract bundle. We need to arm our buyer client with the need to be aware of overriding interest that could exist with regard to the target property that will be binding on our client. Uh, and remember, an overriding interest would be binding on our client whether they are aware of it or not, if a reasonable inspection would have revealed its existence. And thirdly, if a surveyor or valuer is inspecting a property on our client's behalf, again, they may see something that potentially could warrant further investigation on the basis that it is a potential overriding interest. Sorts of things that I would warn clients about, persons in occupation, tenancies with a term of less than three years, um, evidence of any form of prescriptive right or easement over the land or benefiting the land or burdening the land, just highlighting to the client that when the client is inspecting, they should be checking things that potentially have an impact on you and the report on title that you ultimately produce for your client. Generally speaking, if an interest is an overriding interest, unless the land registry tell us it's necessary to protect it by way of uh, noting on the title, its overriding status affords the protection that the client requires who has the benefit of the interest that is overriding. With regard to notices and restrictions, the general rule is that we should be using restrictions to protect beneficial interests under a trust and other types of interest for which the standard forms of restriction are available and we should really thinking about notices as being a default category. So if something isn't an overriding interest, if something can't be protected by a restriction, then we should be asking ourselves, can this interest be protected by notice? In the notes, I then feature some issues with regard to restrictions and there are some important points that I want to uh, dwell on if I can. The first is, that as I've mentioned to practitioners on a number of occasions, restrictions have to be capable of being complied with. I'm gonna sh show you some law relating to that in a moment or two. They mustn't bl blight a title and they're not cast in stone. There are opportunities for restrictions to be disapplied, canceled and modified, which you're aware of. What I'm gonna do today is just show you another way of ensuring that restrictions are moved, removed from the title, relying on the court's inherent jurisdiction. Remember, if you disapply counsel or attempt to modify a restriction and your application is opposed, the Land Registry will refer the matter to First Tier Tribunal and the First Tier Tribunal's jurisdiction with regard to land registration disputes is such that there are strict rules of evidence and there is vulnerability as to costs. And therefore, whilst in the past, it may be of unwise to issue county court proceedings uh, to seek the court's removal or an order for removal of a restriction on the basis that is potentially an expensive way of dealing with it, given the fact that opposed applications from the land registry are going to tribunal and the costs associated with applications and objections are quite high, it is imperative that we do consider the availability of the court's inherent jurisdiction to remove a restriction. <clears throat> so, Let's look at some details, first of all, and some tips and traps with regard to the use of restrictions. Firstly, look at the land registry guidance, in particular with regard to lodging an application. It is important that we understand that the purpose of a restriction is to manage or control the registration of a disposition. So there has to be an interest in land that the restriction is protecting and the restriction must be worded so as to protect or manage or control the registration of the disposition, not the disposition itself. So if we're imposing a restriction that impacts on 
the transfer or what happens at completion and not on registration of a disposition following completion, then we're probably going to fall foul of the land registry guidance and we're probably going to be vulnerable to challenge. So if we're wording restrictions, we need to be careful that the restriction is protecting, controlling or managing the registration of the disposition, not the disposition itself. The second thing to understand and appreciate and the trap that you can fall in with regard to restrictions, particularly where you're creating a bespoke restriction, <coughs> is to understand that the Land Registration Act 2002, 1925 and Land Registration Rules do not define what a disposition is. Therefore, in order for a restriction to be reasonable, in order for a restriction to be capable of being complied with, in order for a restriction not to blight a title, I would always maintain that we define what we mean by a disposition within the restriction that we're creating. And we're making sure that the restriction is doing enough to protect our client's interest in land, but not so much as to mean the restriction can't be complied with. One of the things that's quite interesting, again, from the land registry is the idea that the land registry does not like a restriction being named or specified in the um, in favour of a particular entity or person. Much prefer that the restriction uh, affects or impacts um, a group. Therefore, if a consent is required, the land registry and indeed anyone wanting to comply or deal with the restriction has a class of person to deal with to provide the appropriate consent or certificate rather than an individual. The next point that I make on slide is very important in my view. We do need to make sure that we use um, our, um, we're cautious and that we use our discretion in making sure that restrictioners are aware of their obligations if a restriction is imposed on a title. So let me give you this as an example. You're putting a restriction on a title requiring my consent for the assignment of a lease, for example. In addition to ensuring that the restriction complies with all of those issues that I've just mentioned, it is important that you advise me as to my duties and obligations relating to the restriction. Let's just have a look at those for a moment. Firstly, when the restriction is lodged, if it's lodged on my behalf, it must be lodged with reasonable cause. In other words, there must be a, an interest in land that I possess that the restriction is protecting. Secondly, the restriction must not blight the title. It must be capable of being complied with. And thirdly, I must be aware that if I receive communications from anyone concerning the restriction or communications from the land registry about the restriction, then I've got to react. I can't simply sit back and do nothing or instruct solicitors, and those solicitors fail to do anything on my behalf. At the very least, I must react and acknowledge receipt of whatever the communication is, and if I am not going to comply with whatever is required to enable the restriction to be complied with, I've got to say why. The problem with restrictions quite simply is this, if there is a restriction on a title and the restrictioner is communicated with and fails to do anything, then the land registry are entitled to cancel or modify the restriction. Further, the person wanting to deal with the land is entitled to disapply the restriction. As I mentioned on slide, the land registry like people to use standard forms of restriction wherever possible and as i say if we're creating our own form of restriction it is important to understand and appreciate that the land registry will expect the restriction to be capable of being complied with and rather than the restriction being in favor of an individual better to be in favor of a class of individual or group and therefore if there is one party being uncooperative there are other parties that perhaps can assist if you look at the Land Registration Amendment Rules 2008, <clears throat> a lot of the standard forms of restriction were altered so that solicitors or conveyances acting on behalf of the restrictioner could deal with the restriction on the client's behalf. Very important point with regard to restrictions is this idea of making sure that when we're placing a restriction on a title, the restrictioner, our client, understands their duties and obligations and that we understand what we are required or expected to do.
In a recent case, which is why I mention all of this, this is Key House Admirals Way Land Limited against Rockwell Properties, a 2022 decision. And the court in this case dis decided, as it was perfectly entitled to do, that it had an inherent jurisdiction to remove a restriction on a title. And in doing so, dealt with all of those issues that I mentioned before. Is the restriction protecting an interest in land? Is it capable of being complied with? Does it blight the title? Has the restrictioner been reasonable? And the interesting point that I want to extract and the tip that I want to give you is that as far as the uh, restriction is concerned, it is subject to some important principles, namely that what the restriction is doing is fair, that the process required to comply with the restriction is fair and that it enables applications relating to the restric restriction to be dealt with expeditiously. In other words, as far as the overriding objective is concerned, it is this idea that restrictions can't blight titles, can't be unreasonable and must be capable of being complied with. Quite an interesting case here, there was a restriction placed on a title relating to a development to try and ensure that the development progressed swiftly and as the parties to the agreement intended. A dispute arose which ultimately ended up in litigation. The party wanting the restriction to be removed, not going down the land registration, disapplication, cancellation or modification route, but going down the route of an application to the court. <clears throat> the next thing that I want to mention uh, sorry, if I just go back uh, to this slide, is the fact that as far as the case is concerned, it once again highlights the need to make sure that when a restriction is being placed on the title, the parties understand and the restrictioner understands that the restriction is not cast in stone and that the restrictioner's conduct could mean that an application can be made to the court to remove the restriction or disapplication, cancellation or modification can be made. Page 11 of the notes, I refer to double L restrictions. And again, uh, a tip. A lot of practitioners tell me that they don't like double L restrictions because a double L restriction requires the consent of the original conveyancer that placed the restriction on the title to verify that the registered proprietor is the person dealing with the title at a later date. Now, check this at some length, and I can confirm that a double L restriction can be complied with if the current conveyancer for the client that has the, uh, the restriction imposed on the title verifies their client ID. So a lot of practitioners will say to me, if I'm acting for someone and there's a double L restriction on the title, I'm going to have to go back to the conveyancer that put the restriction on it to get them to verify that the person I'm dealing with is the registered proprietor. That isn't the case. But double L restrictions do impose an obligation on the current conveyancer to verify ID, which can be quite onerous. I've also mentioned in the notes that we can place restrictions on the title with regard to limited companies as well as private individuals. And the last thing that I've mentioned with regard to restrictions is the fact that where a restriction is placed on the title, it is imperative to understand and appreciate that Section 77 of the Land Registration Act 2002 applies and the restriction must be placed on the title and the restriction must have reasonable cause to do so. If you look in the notes, I refer at page 14 and 15 to a case concerning notices. And the important point that I want to emphasize here quite simply is that a notice can be used to protect a contract. It can also be used to protect an equitable lien, namely the deposit, uh, the lien arising from a deposit that's paid on the purchase of a property. And in this case, a Fish and Johns, um, who are administrators of Sky Apartments 2018 Limited, and Sky Apartments 2018 Limited, again, there was a situation where people were buying property and weren't protecting the deposits they were paying by placing a notice on the title. As a consequence of that failure, their uh, deposits were not protected by an equitable lien. The property could be sold and the proceeds of sale um, utilised for the purposes of the administration rather than 
the deposits which had been paid by prospective buyers being returned to them. Had those deposits been protected by notice, then the proceeds of sale would have had to be used to ensure that the uh, deposits were returned to the original buyers. So quite an interesting series of cases, two recent cases, one dealing with restrictions, the other one dealing with notices. The next thing I want to talk about is exempt information status. And again, I'm amazed at how infrequently practitioners realise that we have an open land register, meaning that if we have problems or issues with title, we are able to investigate those problems by looking at documents that have been submitted to the land registry. So my first point is that unless a document is subject to exempt information status or a document relates to a requisition, raised by the land registry, an active requisition, any document that is submitted to the land registry can be called for and can be utilised for whatever purpose is necessary. The land registry were aware of that when the 2002 Act went live and created this concept of exempt information status and then immediately shut the door on applications on the basis that exempt information status was only available in exceptional circumstances. What I want to do and the tip that I want to give you is the fact that the land registry is now more relaxed about exempt information status and has given guidance as to what sort of information might be appropriate for such an application. So in the notes I mentioned that if we're dealing with commercial transactions, profit sharing agreements, turnover and profitability information projected and historic is commercially sensitive and can be subject to exempt information status, so think about turnover leases, joint ventures, etc. Barrelage clauses or other clauses relating to um, sales, etc., are uh, potentially commercially, commercially sensitive. Licensed agreements uh, for licensed premises, barrage agreements, um, agreements relating to petrol sales for petrol stations, etc., commercially sensitive. Uh, provisions in development leases. So where we've got um, a situation where we have sensitive information in a development lease that we don't want other parties to see at a later date. Um, consortia leases where we've got complex funding arrangements and financial restructuring arrangements, particularly useful for insolvency practitioners. Again, important to understand and appreciate the actual rent of at the commencement of the lease is potentially commercially sensitive. <coughs> Intercompany transfers, leases or mortgages, <coughs> rent-free periods and issues with regard to leases. Again, all of these things have the potential to be commercially sensitive and are potentially uh, capable of being subject to an exempt information application. Now, a word of caution. The land registry is given guidance, but that's not to say that every one of these types of application will be successful. But when the application is submitted, the document to which the exempt information status application relates is an exempt document during the application process. If the land registry make a determination that the document is an exempt information status document, then only a redacted version of that document will become a public document. So that's commercial transactions. What about personal transactions? Well, addresses for correspondence relating to fears for health and safety, particularly in sort of marital partnership disputes where there's a risk or threat of domestic violence. Details of beneficial interests under a trust. Financial details in a mortgage, but again, the land registry emphasising a private mortgage rather than institutional mortgage. Uh, issues relating to personal circumstances of parties involved, gender recognition, mental health issues or illegitimacy, uh, and matrimonial ancillary relief orders that contain detailed information, detailed financial information about the parties. So the tip is be aware of exempt information status. 
As far as the application process is concerned, it is quite complicated. You do have to apply. You do have to submit the original document and an edited version of it. With regard to commercial leases, of course, it will be the tenant that makes the application and therefore the landlord would need either in the lease or the agreement for lease to include provision to compel the tenants to make the application or alternatively could be appointed the tenant's attorney, uh, given power of attorney, to lodge the application on the tenant's behalf. If an application is made by a tenant for exempt information status and it is successful, it is important to understand that only the tenant can then apply to remove the exempt information status. One of the things that frequently astounds me with regard to exempt information status applications is where you're acting for a commercial tenant in a transaction and you are aware that other leases have been registered at the land registry with regard to previous deals that the landlord has done. The fact that you're not advising the client, the new tenant, of the fact that it may be possible to draw down the leases that are already registered to see how generous or lack of generosity has been displayed by the landlord in connection with previous deals. All of those things I think are important. There is The tips quite simply is just be aware of the availability of exempt information status where there is commercial, commercially sensitive information and be aware that the land registry is a little more relaxed in connection with such applications. Two further points. Um, you can make a Freedom of Information Act request to see the original document and certainly the police, HMRC and other uh, public bodies are entitled to see the original document on application to the land registry. So it's not blanket confidentiality. And of course, on that very issue, if we are so co concerned about commercially sensitive information relating to a documentation, then it's important that the conveyances and the client are aware that it's commercially sensitive and the appropriate protection is provided with regard to confidentiality agreements, etc. The next thing that I want to explore, if possible, is the issue concerning addresses for service. And again, I've mentioned this in a number of different contexts, but I wanted to bring it together today because I think there are a number of things that are important and some tips and traps that are very, very significant for conveyances, commercial or residential. The first is when advising a seller in connection with a conveyancing transaction, be it residential or commercial, it is absolutely essential that when you onboard your client, you check the address for service or the addresses for service at the land registry that the client has provided to the land registry as opposed to the contact details that the client has given you. So I instruct you to act in connection with the sale of four Acacia Gardens, Guildford. It is important that when I've given you my contact details, my contact details show that my address uh, is for Arcasia Avenue, Guildford, and that when you check at the land registry, when you download the official copies of the register, that's the address for service that's been provided to the land registry too. If I give you address, an address of four Beverly Close Home as my contact details and I'm selling that property in Guildford and the land registry has an address, Acacia Avenue's Guildford as the address for service, alarm bells ring. You would certainly be on an inquiry that there is the potential here for identity fraud. So what you'd be obliged to do is to ask the seller for an explanation. And again, I think this is one of the important points with regard to identity fraud. It's not enough when you're onboarding a client simply to do your AML checks and to do your identity checks either by way of electronic verification or sort of manual paper-based systems and thinking that's it. You've got to be able to um, link information and data that you're receiving with other data so that you can cross-check information that's been provided. So that's very important when acting on a sale. If acting on in connection with a purchase, then again, from a buyer's perspective, it is important that clients are made aware of the need to keep addresses for service up to date. I've just recently been doing some work with regard to adverse possession claims and also some claims relating to unilateral notices. 
where a unilateral notice has been placed on the title and the paper title owner has not been made aware of the existence of a unilateral notice because the address for service at the land registry is out of date. The land registry will utilize the address for service provided to them as the main contact point for your client. And therefore, if an address is wrong, if an address is out of date, that can cause huge potential problems for clients. For example, your client may not be aware of an adverse possession claim being made. Your client may not be aware of a fraud that's being instituted against them. Your client may not be aware of a unilateral notice or other application being made relevant to their title. Therefore, you should advise the client of the need to have up to three addresses for service including an email address you should advise clients to keep their addresses for service at the land registry up to date and at the conclusion of your instruction in a purchase transaction i would remind the client of their obligations i would also when the client has sent out to them a transfer for signature again highlighting the address for services the addresses for service that are installed at that point uh, again, I was just looking at a negligence claim over the weekend and you had a situation where the client was uh, buying a property as co-owner, so two people buying a property. The box 10 of the transfer um, was inconsistent with the client's instructions relating to co-ownership and in indeed the advice that they had received. But the client was just simply sent the transfer and told to read it and sign it. And the question that was put to me is, would it be prudent to, when acting for a co-owner, to advise the client to look carefully at what's said in box 10 to confirm that complies with instructions? And my attitude is that the transfer document is an important document and issues relating to certain aspects of it should be highlighted to the buyer client. So certainly, yeah, as far as box 10 is concerned, the client made aware of what it says and you cross-check to make sure that what you've said in box 10 is consistent with what your instructions are and what advice you've given. And also with regard to addresses for service, just simply highlighting to the client, these are the contact details that the client will communicate with you uh, in the future. And therefore it's important that what we say in the transfer is accurate. Um, a lot of practitioners tell me they don't use or don't advise clients to use email addresses as an address for service. And my attitude is, I think we should, obviously, because it's a quicker means of uh, communicating. And secondly, of course, it means that um, if the client moves or if the client is spending more time at work or abroad or whatever, the client is going to receive communications far more swiftly and far more efficiently. I concede, however, that having an email address uh, displayed in what is a public register might have implications with regard to vulnerability to fraud but uh, again I'm sure that clients are aware generally of the problems with regard to email addresses and the availability of those addresses and the potential for fraud. So tips and traps with regard to addresses for service on a sale make sure that we're checking clients address for service against our clients contact details that they provided for us when we're advising a buyer throughout the transaction making sure our client is aware of the significance and importance of their address for service at the land registry being kept up to date highlighting to clients the sorts of communication that the client may well receive from the land registry and the significance of reacting as we'll see in a moment or two when we talk about issues and problems associated with adverse possession. Uh, the whole land registration process relating to adverse possession revolves around the fact that a paper title owner, where appropriate, <coughs> reacts to a claim for adverse possession by serving a counter notice. And uh, at that point, the um, administrative method of dealing with adverse possession becomes a sort of contentious process rather than simply an administrative task. Dealing with requisitions. Uh, the problem, uh, the landlords are telling me at the moment that they are still being uh, faced with applications that are leading to high numbers of uh, requisitions. At some points in time up to 50% of all applications are generating requisitions and the 
tip that I want to give you is that the land registries produce checklists for the common type of applications and the common sorts of requisitions that flow from it. I've given you some examples within the notes. Uh, the land registry highlight in particular avoidable requisitions, which are a sort of uh, a nightmare list of some very common and obvious mistakes that clearly the land registry are encountering on a regular basis. The tip that I would give you is if you've got support staff, secretarial staff or inexperienced staff, the land registry checklists that are available on the land registry website are very useful for fairness to have on their case management systems or on files, etc., just to make sure that when documents are being sent off to the land registry, they are not generating the avoidable requisitions that the land registry is so concerned about. Of course, there is the uh, further point of making sure that requisitions are dealt with promptly and efficiently. If there is a problem or a likelihood of a delay relating to requisition, then ask for an extension of time and keep the land registry informed as to what the problems or issues are. And of course, it is also important to make sure that if you're acting for a lender, that they're aware of the problem or issues that you're encountering. Conscious of time, but I'm just going to keep going if I may. Um, adverse possession. In the notes, I've given you some cases, two cases in particular. Uh, Dow's against City of Bradford Metropolitan Council and King and another, and another against the benefits of Newburn. And these cases highlight some very basic and important points. In the case of Dow's against City of Bradford Metropolitan District Council, what you had in essence was an adverse possession claim based on the uh, nature of a neighbour encroachment. But this wasn't a question of sort of moving a fence and claiming a metre or two of garden. It was moving a fence or moving a boundary and claiming a two acre field. And the issue that the court had to consider was, was this an appropriate means of claiming adverse possession for what was quite a significant area? There are two points really that I'd like to make about this case. Firstly, councils, district councils and county councils seem to be prime paper title owners that are vulnerable to adverse possession claims. So if clients have land banks, if clients have vast amounts of title registered or unregistered, it is important that they have systems and processes in place that enable land to be inspected to watch out for the potential for adverse possession claims. The second point with regard to this is that um, as far as this application was concerned, it was made under Schedule 6, Paragraph 3, where a counter notice had been lodged, and the third condition was relied upon by the applicant, namely the neighbour encroachment ground. The land to which the application related is adjacent to land belonging to the applicant. The exact line of the boundary between the two hasn't been determined for at least 10 years for the, of the period of adverse possession on the date of application. The applicant or any pre predecessor in title reasonably believed the land to which the application related belonged to them. Now, some interesting points there. Firstly, how can you make a claim for adverse possession? Why would you make a claim for adverse possession if you had a reasonable belief that the land to which the application related belongs to you. Well, the point here that the court emphasised and other courts have emphasised too is, clearly, you will not have a reasonable belief to support the contention that the land belongs to you if you're making a claim for adverse possession. The key is, during the 10-year period, did you have that reasonable belief? And what would constitute a reasonable belief? Well, either your conveyance or an acquisition tells you that the land belongs to you, or um, thereafter, on reasonable inquiry, you are of the view, looking at the title, looking at other issues, the land that you are occupying belongs to you. It is important to understand and appreciate that as far as this reasonable belief is concerned, it is important that it is reasonable. The fact that you think it's yours, but there isn't any reasonable ground to suggest that is the case would not be enough. It's not a subjective test. The other interesting thing about the case of Douse was that the case emphasises the fact that where an adverse possession claim is made, 
it is imperative that the paper title owner objects to the application in doing so triggering or limiting the potential scope for the adverse possession claim to succeed the second case that i mentioned is a 2019 decision but it's just recently been drawn to my attention and it's quite an interesting case because in this one what we had was a claim for adverse possession being made in connection with a with a vault in a disused church and what was interesting in this case was that there was no real access to the vault it was a family vault there wasn't a sort of a door or a, a trap door into the vault there were tiles that had to be removed to gain access access was very infrequent only when members of this particular family had died in the past was the vault be opened to enable the deceased to be placed within the vault uh, but nonetheless despite that infrequency of use despite the fact that um, the occasions were so rare as to be uh, you know once every 50 60 100 years or so nonetheless that was sufficient to defeat a claim for adverse possession it's quite an unusual case on its facts but just highlights the fact that where the paper title owner still maintains some form of use of the land that can defeat a claim for adverse possession even where that use is very very infrequent the next thing i want to talk about are electronic signatures and again this is something that uh, is quite interesting and i'm coming encountering sort of two schools of thought school of thought number one are firms that are saying we don't like the idea of electronic signatures at all we're going to use wet ink signatures until we're dragged uh, kicking and screaming into the current times and modern times and other schools uh, uh, the second school of thought is no let's adopt this this is very useful uh, the idea of electronic signatures really came to fruition courtesy of the problems associated with lockdown the mercury signature system was used quite commonly and remains to be used quite commonly by our commercial colleagues uh, if you look at the city of london law society you'll have seen the idea of mercury signatures being uh, utilized in commercial transactions for many years now the land registry is now taking on board the use of mercury signatures and what i've done within the notes at page 29 is listed the process there are a number of golden rules tips and traps that we need to be aware of tips and traps rule number one it is important that where we're using any form of electronic signature mercury or a certified electronic signature that all parties are represented by conveyances it's also useful in my view to ensure that the buyer's conveyance it takes the lead with regard to the use of electronic signatures on the basis that it will be the buyer's conveyance that will be submitting documentation to the land registry and therefore needs to ensure that the electronic signature system that's been utilized is accepted by the land registry the second point that i think is significant with regard to the process is that it's agreed early on in the transaction or as early on as is possible that electronic signature is to be used in connection with transfers or mortgage deeds or whatever document is going to be subject to that signature all the conveyances all the parties to the transaction have to agree to the system that is being used with regard to a mercury signing remember what we've got in essence is the clients executing the execution page of a document and nothing more so the signature page of a document is um, downloaded is executed uh, using a wetting signature it is then scanned and sent back to wherever the document came from the document needs to be properly witnessed in order to be validly executed but in essence what the mercury signing process allows is one page being downloaded being printed off being executed being returned and then being attached to the balance of the document and nonetheless the document being validly executed prior to mercury signatures being in vogue and being in common use there would always be an argument that the document had not been validly executed where only the execution page or the signature page had been signed um, 
and you had sort of ridiculous situations where in order for a, a signature to be a valid execution of a document, the recipient of the document would have to print all the document off, would have to staple the document together, would then have to have the document signed and witnessed, would then have to de-staple uh, the document and load it back into uh, the scanner, have the document scanned and have it sent back. The idea of the mercury signing process is really a convenience method for having documents signed uh, more efficiently and having to go away from the charade of having the entire document printed off, constituted, executed, deconstituted, re-scanned re and sent back. So mercury signing, nothing too exciting there to be honest with you. The tips and traps really are to make sure that everyone is aware that documents are going to be signed using this process and to make sure that the steps that I've listed at 7.1 at page 29 of the notes are complied with. Again, just because we're using this system does not alleviate the need to make sure that we check signatures, we check that documents have been properly executed, we check that documents are fully complete um, before being lodged the land registry or sent elsewhere. The next thing that I mentioned, this is page 30 of the notes, conveyance of certified electronic signatures. And again, this is of course different, but there are some basic principles that are exactly the same as mercury signatures, namely that all the parties to the transaction are represented by conveyances. There are some exceptions, three of which I've mentioned in the notes. It is important that all the conveyances agree to the use of a conveyance certified electronic signature. That doesn't mean that everyone has to agree that all the signatures are uh, undertaken in the same form. Having said that, a good tip and good practice is if we're using one platform in an ideal world, it would be nice that the other party to the document uses the same platform. It would make life significantly easier. It is important that all conveyances agree to the use of conveyancer certified electronic signatures. And the conveyancer is responsible for the setting up and controlling of the, of the signature process using the platform that's chosen. A tip and a trap. Make sure that if you have a platform for electronic signatures, there is a paper trail to show that you have checked the security of that platform and that you have the appropriate documentation available for CQS audit uh, for professional indemnity insurance purposes. Uh, it, just because the platform has been set up by a recognized body or institution doesn't necessarily mean that all the appropriate security measures are in place. It is incumbent on your firm to check the position. Now, of course, the vast majority of these platforms will have all of that in place and will have all the documentation available. It's important, however, that you have some form of check with regard to that information. Again, there are requirements of the land registry with regard to the process of certified electronic signatures. Again, a need to upload final agreed copy documents, including plans to the platform. Again, a requirement for populating name, address, email address and mobile number of signatories and witnesses, making sure that fields are, that are required to be completed using the platform are properly completed, and making sure that as far as the signatories are concerned, they understand the process that is being utilised. Again, the whole system involves checks and balances with regard to signatories being made aware of the significance of the documents they're being si uh, they're signing and what's happening to the documents during the process. Um, remember that this is a system that the land registry has approved and therefore if you are using electronic signatures if this process has not been properly adopted or complied with and there is evidence of it uh, and there is no evidence of it the land registry may requisition you. 
it might be appropriate to have some form of again checklist that um, FIAN has utilized to confirm that the certified electronic signature process and the steps required by the land registry are complied with. Now I don't know what you're finding, I'm finding more and more that firms are certainly familiar with Mercury and becoming aware of the availability of electronic signatures, predominantly with regard to um, remortgages and uh, again in a remortgage context it, it may not be necessary for the conveyancer to actually be directly involved in the client's sig signature to the mortgage deed. There are platforms that lenders are using that sort of are out with the certified electronic signature process created by the land registry. But certainly where you are using a platform for electronic signatures, for transfers, uh, etc., then it's important to be aware of the requirements of the land registry and to have a checklist to make sure that fairness comply with that process. And that's me finished. First of all, a thousand apologies again with regard to my connectivity problems and a thousand apologies for overrunning, Stephen, but hopefully that's been of use to practitioners. If anyone has any questions or queries arising from anything that I've said, feel free to drop me a note. Do have a look at the Land Registry Local Land Charges process. Also have a look at the um, situation with regard to electronic signatures. And the other point to mention is that uh, I am doing some work at the moment with regard to the Land Registry and Restrictive Covenants. And be aware that there are a lot of data resources that are available at the land registry that are quite useful when you're setting up systems and processes relating to reports on title, etc. So you can see the sort of the, the vast array of restrictive covenants that are being uh, noted on registered titles uh, that can assist you with regard to advice and assistance to people within the firm, particularly support staff, uh, when being required to deal with or give advice with regard to restrictive covenants. So I'm going to turn my slides off if I can. And uh, I'm now going to, Stephen, ask if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Ian. And, and yeah, once again, thank you to everyone else for, for staying on. And apologies for the earlier technical issues. Um, yeah. We're now going to be uh, answering questions submitted during the session. We do just right. have the, the one question, which I think, to be honest, given the circumstances, is probably not a bad thing. Um, Ian. Mm. So uh, the question is uh, with regards to removal of non-standard restrictions, as from Natasha. Yeah. Uh, and she asks, we have a non-standard restriction on title that needs to be removed. Uh, ST5 is stat deck for removal of form A restriction. Yeah. Is there another ST form that can be used for removal of non-standard restriction? A solicitor certificate is allowed to be produced to land registry to remove this non-standard restriction. Is there a standard certificate you can direct me to, please? No, there isn't. Uh, I think there is a sort of a, a, a standard form of statement of truth that you use in all circumstances. And I think, was it Natasha? That's correct, yes. Yeah. yeah, I think Natasha would have to use that document. But again, what I would say, uh, even if Natasha drops me a note, I'll have a look and I'll have a, a chat with one of my contacts at the land registry. But I think my view would be that you would use the standard statement of truth form that would be would be the appropriate form. There isn't a set form for non-standard restrictions and the form that you'd use for standard restrictions would not be appropriate. So I think if Natasha drops me a note as to what the restriction is, I could perhaps share uh, what the statement of truth would need to contain to assist with regard to the removal of the restriction. Um, remember, with restrictions, you can disapply, cancel or modify. Um, in a situation where, such as Natasha's, it's always best if a restriction can't be complied with to cancel or modify the restriction so the change is permanent. Disapplication would only be appropriate where the restriction can't be complied with in connection with the current disposition. So uh, I can't really answer the question other than to say to Natasha, I think you'd use a standard form of statement of truth. I don't think there is a, a form that would be appropriate 
that the land registry is generated for non-standard restrictions. If Natasha wants a hand as to what she should be saying in the restriction, if she sends me details of what the restriction is, I can give her some pointers. And if you like, Stephen, uh, again, if Natasha didn't mind, whilst uh, preserving sort of client confidentiality, if I've got any views or any sort of guidance with regard to what should be said in the statement of truth that might be of use for other delegates today, I'm happy to share that with you and you could uh, share that with others. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Ian. And um, uh, Natasha, if you did want to get in touch, um, if, if you send an email uh, via GoToWebinar, I will receive that and I can pass anything on to Ian there if you want to take that yeah. further. Um, we have just had one more question in, yeah. um, Ian, so I will just take that. It's from uh, Graham. Graham's asked, how long does the land registry take to register a title by adverse possession uh, where deeds are lost? Right. Sorry. Great question. Right. First of all, uh, I wouldn't be that confident that the land registry will register you with anything where deeds are lost. OK, if deeds are lost by the client, if there isn't any secondary evidence as to what those deeds contained, and if the applicant is not, in fact, in occupation of the property, I've seen land registry officers just refuse to register anything and have said what you've got to do is wait um, if the land's unregistered 12 years and bring a claim for adverse possession upon expiry of that date. Where deeds and documents are lost by lenders or solicitors and where there is secondary evidence, marked abstracts, epitomes of title, etc., then it depends on your land registry officer, to be honest with you, as to what you'll get. If we're going to be very optimistic, Graham, you might get an absolute title. I've seen that done, but not over recent years. In recent years, what the land registry has done is granted a possessory title. And in those circumstances where a possessory title is created, remember that it is possible to upgrade that title to an absolute title, provided there isn't a challenge in the next 12 years. The other thing to note is where deeds and documents are lost, where a possessory title is granted and those documents reappear or resurface, you can apply to upgrade the moment those deeds and documents are in your possession, uh, uh, provided, of course, that they reveal that your client, the uh, adverse possessor, was the lawful owner of the unregistered title beforehand. So, Graham, I think you've got a potentially a bit of a battle on your hand. I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that your client is in possession hoping that your client has some secondary evidence to support the title that they are claiming and hoping that the deeds and documents uh, the secondary evidence sort of uh, will be acceptable by the land registry but uh, when i first started doing conveyancing um the land registry was not susceptible to fraud or not aware of fraud as it is now and if you even if your client lost deeds and documents, if you submitted a stat deck to confirm the position that you'd seen them, etc., and what the documents revealed, then the land registry would register you with something. These days, I'm rather pessimistic as to what the land registry will do, and therefore I always urge caution. But thanks for that question, Graham. Um, the key is to make sure that you've got secondary evidence as to what the title was, make sure you've got clear land charges searches against former estate owners if you're able to identify who they are and you need to make sure that uh, you are uh, providing evidence to the land registry that your client is in occupation of, of the land obviously for the adverse possession claim to succeed thanks for that question Stephen. yeah thanks Ian. so great graham did actually come back just to uh, clarify and said applicant is in occupation and title was deduced many years ago on a sale of part Right. OK, well, in that case, I'm moderately happy that the only question that's missing is who who lost them or when were they lost? Yeah, OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we can probably... If a lawyer or lender lost them, then I'm far more optimistic. Excellent. OK, thank you. Um, thanks, Ian, and thanks, Graham, for that uh, question. Um, I think given the time, I think uh, with, we are a bit short on questions. I think we will wrap it up there. Um, I just need to say um, 
thank you to Ian and to everyone for, for staying on for today's session. Yeah, if you. you do have any other questions, please do contact myself or Ian. Um, as I explained uh, a while ago, if you respond via GoToWebinar, the automated emails, the, the responses come direct to myself. So I'll be able to answer any questions or send them on to, to Ian for him to answer as well. You will also receive a separate email from my colleague, Robert Kelly, which will have a copy of the slides, the notes and a recording of the session for today. But that just leaves me to say on behalf of Stuart Title, Ian Quayle uh, and myself, thank you for joining us for today's session and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone and goodbye.